when responding to active shooter events, there's a lot of critical things that have to happen very quickly. But one of the things that we don't talk about much at all is the important duties, the handful of important duties that the perimeter group has to get done to keep things from going sideways. That's today's topic. Stick around. Welcome to the Active Shooter Incident Management Podcast. My name is Bill Godfrey, your podcast host. I'm here with two of my fellow uh, NSEER instructors at the National Center for Integrated Emergency Response. Uh, both of them are law enforcement. Pete Kelting, back in the house. How you doing? Great. Pleasure to be here, Bill. Thanks. Good to have you back. And Billy Perry, I'm getting to see a lot of you now, man. I like it. I like it. I, like I love it. Thanks it for too. having me back. All right. So you guys are up on this one more than uh, me on the fire EMS side. Uh, but today, and we have not talked about this. I was going back and looking at our previous podcast. We've not talked about that handful of critical functions that the perimeter has got to do to kind of keep things flowing the right direction and, and going sideways on an event. So that's our topic today. So just kind of remind everybody on the on the active shooter incident management checklist, uh, for those that are, that are watching, there is a section here on perimeter, and there's basically – Three bullet points that we want them to hit. Uh, one, and this is for the perimeter group supervisor who's who's standing it up, is to get his team on a separate radio channel so they're they're not tying up airtime for the tactical channel. Establish an inner perimeter, and then establish an outer perimeter and manage their their uh, staffing accordingly. The uh, the number of resources, what they want versus what they may have, and how they're going to deploy it. But that belies something to make it seem simple that really isn't simple. It's not simple. It, well, let me let me say it is simple. It's it's a simple concept. It's the application that's hard. Just like losing weight. It's easy to lose weight. Burn more calories than you take in and you lose weight. This concept is simple. It's the application that's hard. Amen. Right. War. <laughs> Kill more people, break more stuff than they do of yours, and you win. Concept simple. It's the application that's hard. And that's the way the perimeter is. Plus, it's been the redheaded stepchild of tactics forever. But it's crucially important. Pete, what do you think? What's the what are what are some of the the key things that you think are commonly just overlooked or become problems on perimeter? I think it's that we're first focused on getting resources downrange to that initial you know, threat. And obviously that's important. But a lot of those resources that are making that decision as they're responding to the scene are very well skilled at assisting with certain aspects of perimeters. So getting that perimeter group supervisor in place pretty quickly to identify the resources needed uh, really, really helps a lot. All right. So let me ask a specific question. Uh, let me put it into specific. So we're in the early part of the incident. We're five, seven, Eight minutes in, we got a couple of contact teams that are down range. Tactical stood up. First supervisors on scene. One of their first duties is to call for a perimeter group. You've still got a lot of people responding, but not a ton of people that are there yet. So maybe perimeter gets stood up with a group supervisor and three or four officers to start with. What does that begin to look like for an inner perimeter let, let's assume it's a school, school, the typical school campus, you know, a high school or something like that. And you're having to play that group, uh, that role of perimeter group supervisor, and you've got yourself and three others. What's your deployment strategy? What are you, what are you thinking for that inner perimeter? So inner perimeter, you know, in my perspective is, is that support to the folks working downrange, right? The inner perimeter is mainly looking at setting up quickly as possible to keep that bad actor from getting out. And so making sure that we can parse those resources as quickly as possible to support that, that initial inner perimeter uh, is important to get that done pretty quickly. Right. The inner perimeter generally, and this is generally, is exponentially smaller than the outer perimeter. And it's literally just containing, like Pete said, the bad guy. It is a contain. It's keeping everything in, inner, and the outer perimeter is keeping everybody out, or at least it's supposed to. It's supposed, it's supposed to. to. The challenge comes from what you're alluding to, is the porous nature of perimeters. 
then let's go there. When we see problems, both in training and with live events with perimeter, is it generally an inner perimeter problem or an outer perimeter problem, in your opinion? Yes. <laughs> All of the above, both. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Um, well, let's let, then let's work our way from the inside out. What are some of the big things that the inner perimeter that, that, that goes wrong or they fail to do? What are those key items that, that are consistently missed? Well, one of them is, and this, this is going to become a constant theme throughout almost every podcast, is a lack of knowledge, a lack of of what their response to resistance tactics are, or policy, not tactics, policies are. Not knowing when they can, when they can't, when they have a duty to utilize force, like for the inner perimeter. Like not understanding truthfully that, you know, because we, I know of instances where we had forcible felons leave the perimeter, and you're like, who saw? I did. Well, why didn't you stop it? And Pete, yep. have you lived that dream as well? I have. And, you know, and then vice versa, when people are showing up, did you not get stopped by the outer perimeter, you know, and the poorest nature of it? But the biggest challenge is who gets manned on it. Because occasionally you will get a really strack officer that is mandated to be there and they will do a really good job. The challenge is who ends up doing perimeters generally are the ones that volunteer for it. Just like one of the things when I would teach emergency assault, emergency apprehension teams, with the responding patrol officers to the patrol division, I even sit, told supervisors, you never have to, ne and this is, back me up on this, Pete, you'll, you'll never have to say, you go handle traffic. You don't, because every agency has somebody that, I don't want to use the word coward, so inject it where you think it needs to go. Um, everybody has, every agency has those officers that will self-deploy. They sound very officious on the radio. I'll go ahead and take traffic. I'll, I'll, I'll do signal 38 over here or whatever. Am I, is that accurate or? That exists. And, uh, and so they're going to do that. And I think the same thing happens on perimeters because they don't want to go downrange necessarily truthfully. And the ones you have that are really good, you have a great department or somebody got mandated and they're generally timid, they're overwhelmed, and they are, they're not strong in their decision-making capabilities, and it leads to porousness. So obviously that can happen. Now, in, in the process that we teach, your perimeter is getting a sign from the pool that's at staging. And so to a degree, it's luck of the draw, timing of the arrival, and all that kind of stuff. But Pete, when it comes specifically just to the inner perimeter, what are the, what are the gaps that you think we see that that are consistently problematic with the inner perimeter. Just just looking at the, your physical footprint in the sense of how you're where you're first deploying your your perimeter folks to. If you're pushing contact teams in from the number one side of the building, you, most inherently your weak sides are going to be beyond that, and deploy perimeter units to to backfill that aggressive push from the contact teams, and then fill in the rest of your perimeter as quickly as possible. So just, you know, get, getting your eyes on a, on a map and seeing, you know, what's your, your operational responsibilities of your contact teams moving and how you get that inner perimeter into support that uh, those teams' movement is one of the first key things you got to look at. If, if I could add, one of the things, Pete comes from a SWAT background. I come from a tactical and bomb background as well. The big challenge is Everybody doesn't know what a perimeter is. Every officer doesn't. Absolutely. I thought that was like no. day two of no. the academy. They don't know how to build a, a good type perimeter. They don't under, I mean, they know the literal definition, but they may not be good at setting up a perimeter. Is that not accurate? No, accurate, 100%. When you talk about just, you know, responding to a call, uh, perimeter, you know, should have its own time in the, in the box training during the year 100%. It's just specifically talking about how you set up perimeters too and the, the type of call makes a difference too obviously we're talking about active shooter here so it's a little bit more focused but yes absolutely more training set up, on perimeter you know we need to be able to set up good perimeters for armed robbers for stolen cars at bail all that i mean one of the one of the things that probably hasn't changed in in the age of law enforcement in the sense when i've ever was introduced to a perimeter was the old saying, right, Billy, start big. It's easier to Make shrink it down than it is to, than expand, to, it. to expand it. 
Now, on an inner perimeter, we're wanting to get pretty tight into our tactical area of operation. But even then, you got to be careful that mm -hmm. you don't suck in too close, depending on the time that you're already, uh, you know, benchmark time, you're already downrange with the, with this, the incident. So the the thing that I think I've observed, you know, again, coming coming from a fire guy, what, what do I know, right? But the thing I've observed from inner perimeter with some some frequency, some commonality, is a tendency to just zone out. You know, they're they're when they first deploy, and they get to their post, they're paying attention, they do, you know, handful of scans, but within five minutes, their mind has wandered. They're no longer watching like their area the, the way the courthouse scenario leaning up against a tree. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're they're no longer watching their area. Um, the other thing that I think goes along with that is a missed opportunity is when the additional resources are moving in. There's a chance for perimeter to kind of for for those inner perimeter units to be able to say, you know, they're they're over this direction. Uh, I saw a team going this way. Uh, you know, work around to this side, you got more cover that, you know, they've already got some sense of lay of the land, but I don't see them engaging in the opportunity to kind of give a quick lay of the land briefing to those other resources that are coming in, which is generally going to be rescue task forces. Sometimes there's additional contact teams coming in, but it's usually the RTFs coming in. And I, <clears throat> that's something I always kind of wondered it's almost like it, it. They didn't feel like it was their responsibility to to do things like that. Well, and if you if you don't understand the importance of a perimeter, then you don't understand the importance of your job and how valuable an asset you truly are. Look at South Florida. Outer perimeter apprehended active shooters in the past. You know, so I mean, it's pretty huge. So. Speaking of which, let's segue over to outer perimeter because it seems like we have um, a little more work to do there than we do anywhere else. So as you guys both mentioned, the job of the outer perimeter is to isolate the scene and to keep anyone else from coming in. Let's take a typical high school of a thousand, you know, thousand, twelve hundred kids. Typical campus. What are you looking at? for an outer perimeter on something like that? What's the number of officers you're, you're thinking? Well, you just described my school, and it's 64 <laughs> acres. Yeah, I was just going to say. So, I mean, you can look at it online. I mean, that's, you know, so a perimeter has to be exactly, it has to form a perimeter. You know, so you at least have to be line of sight with each other, you know, with, with your right and left. Absolutely, unless, you know, unless you got, you know, wooded area. But it, right. it has a lot to do with, you know, how many – Ingress, egress, uh, you have to Rounds. the school. What, you know, is it sitting next to a neighborhood that's got tons of streets by it? I mean, so, but quickly, just when you said that, I mean, and I was already into the the dozen, you know, 10, 12 folks to try to button up a outer perimeter pretty quickly. Okay. So we're, we're talking a dozen or more, probably going to, in a school scenario where you got parents coming to the scene, probably going to be more than a dozen, Ex is it not? Yeah, it's going to be yeah. several, several. And then dozen. the outer perimeter is also going to be responsible for, Diverting traffic? I think yeah, they yeah, got to lock it down. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. One of the one of the biggest faults that we run into is is not gaining control of our our ingress egress and our intersections to make sure that you know the, the the high school parents aren't just driving. I mean, they started responding two seconds after we were responding because of the text social messaging, network, text right. messaging today, right? So as soon as we we lose that control, they're hanging on a fence trying to see you know parking blocking our right. response, um, maybe even taking strategic areas for their parking where we wanted to park. So grabbing that traffic portion of the outer perimeter and locking down the the, the roads and the intersections is huge. And you mentioned this not getting control of intersections and our ingress egress. That's a big one that I see from the fire EMS side is we may or may not have an effective outer perimeter, but we have not maintained a corridor for the ambulances to be able to get in and out of the of the scene. And that tends to be something that I've seen not only in training, but I've seen consistently in real life events as well. You look at the videos, you look at the pictures, they really, really struggle to maintain that corridor. Now, obviously, that first dozen or so officers that get there are going to park wherever they park and, and, you know, go do their thing. But once perimeter begins to get stood up, 
why is it such a challenge to get control of that of that flood of additional officers coming in because they're supposed to be going to staging why does that break down to be such a problem at perimeter i think it's multifaceted i think not not truly understanding your mission is one issue i think it's hard to tell your peer no right seriously i think they're wanting to go in and do great things and you know they can say you're you know you're not the boss of me i'm going in here i mean there, there, there's a, a myriad of reasons and i, I think it, it comes from emotions i think it comes from both parties not really understanding their policy and what they what they need to do seriously that kind of thing he hit it on the nail is that you know i'm responding billy's on grabbed the intersection i'm responding to the event and i'm blowing by because i think i I think i'm needed down there and who's billy to tell me not to keep going but that back that up it goes to communication and and you know quick identification of staging quick communication to to a perimeter group supervisor and a team saying you know make sure all your folks know where staging is at so if i'm coming in and billy stops me and says hey 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 you know staging go over that way is that where you're trying to get to is staging yeah staging go to staging instead of just letting me go right on by and that's not when we need to train it. This is why your policies need to be current. Your policies need to be accurate. They need to have things like this so they know to do that so they're not just self-deploying. And I, I want to underscore this one because, you know, we one of our instructors had an event, real-life event, that went really fairly well. It didn't go perfectly. They had a couple of challenges. But the initial response went very well. Threat was were neutralized very quickly. The injured were rescued and transported in damn near record time. And then the out-of-county mutual aid law enforcement units began arriving and ignored the instructions from the perimeter to go to staging and pushed into the scene. So they pushed past the outer perimeter, they pushed past the inner perimeter, self-deployed into the scene, began kicking indoors. And this was 20 minutes post-event, Suspects were in custody. All the injured were off the scene. They were literally at the clearing phase. There was no, uh, there was no, no driving stimulus. force. There was no stimulus, and yet we're kicking doors and doing hard dynamic entries on um, uh, what turned out to be fairly young kids. Um, and I don't think that's an isolated incident. I don't so either. what's it going to take to get law enforcement to understand? that that is part of the job of perimeter is to keep that polyester dog pile from ending up downrange and get them into staging instead and to control just the flow of responders in and out of the scene. Training. Right. Good it, training. It, you said staging, right? Two years, three years ago, we were talking about what's it going to take to get staging managers <laughs> trained to effectively – Managed staging, right? So hand in hand with with perimeter. I mean, law enforcement agencies, you know, we're so apt to to design our our training agendas for the day around the actual, you know, hot topic of active shooter or something else. Let's pick a day just to do staging and in perimeter, staging and perimeter. I agree. And I think explaining why we need to know the perimeter because we're not trying to we're trying not trying to promote inaction. We're not trying to promote losing inertia we're explaining why this is better why we need to control this to protect the scene we're not talking about just doing it so arbitrarily there is a reason an articulable reason for this and i think it's important that they understand i think especially today's generation they need to understand the why and you can agree you can disagree it doesn't matter it just it is it is what it is give them the why let them know why here's why you need to understand this because we need to we need to protect the scene. We need to protect the inner perimeter. We need to protect protect the guys and gals that are in there in, as the entry team, as the emergency apprehension team, as the emergency assault team. And if you explain the why, and this is more efficient, it's better. It's it's an integral part. It's super important, and you need to be able to to have a non porous perimeter. Okay, so we've hit the inner perimeter, the outer perimeter. We've talked about the need to be able to obviously contain any fleeing suspect and capture them, the need to manage our own response and our own resources, keep our ingress and egress open. So we've covered that. Now let's talk about 
the civilian reaction. The and rogue do-gooder. <clears throat> I think the rogue do-gooder. I think. Um, well, let's I, let me split it this way because there are some special considerations. I think schools are a special consideration, mm-hmm. hospitals, airports, special considerations. Right. But let's just talk in churches in general. <clears throat> the what are the kind of challenges that the outer perimeter, who has all of these duties that we just discussed, plus is going to potentially be facing off with the general public, some of whom may or may not have a personal vested interest in what's going on inside the perimeter, some that may just be looky-loos or do-gooders. Right. What are the kinds of things that they need to be prepared to deal with? And at what point do you say, do you look around and go, I'm by myself and I'm outnumbered. I need a friend. Um, well, Pete, what do you think? I mean, you named all the special considerations and all the things that come with that. And when you pull that aside at any other perimeter, it starts to affect traffic period, right? You start getting overwhelmed with if you're shutting or shutting down or changing a, a traffic pattern at a particular intersection. Now you're impacting everybody else's life going on that isn't really sure what's happening on the other side. And that becomes a problem itself. You know, do we shut down, you know, the interstate? Do we, you know, change this pattern? And and we've got to be able to have enough resources to handle that. And too often we think, well, they just have to wait. You know, we've got to deal with all this. And it's important that we attend to that and be able to identify those resources quickly. In fact, one of the roles of Incident Command is to work with their PIO to make those announcements and try to to offload some of that local traffic by telling people we've got this situation going on, stay out of the area, avoid the area, these roads are closed. And if you have an ineffective command post, that either never comes or it comes so late that it's not usable. Right. But Billy, from your perspective, what are what are the the th- you know, guys and gals that are on the on the post, there's they're standing in the position at the outer perimeter. What are the things they're going to deal with, and at what point do they got to go, okay, it's time for me to get some help? Well, I think you brought up a school. I I work in a school. I know parents. I do not know of any school shooting that hasn't had at least one, if not several, very belligerent parents. I'm going in there to get my kid, and you can't stop me. And that's something that needs to be addressed beforehand. You need to know. You need to be thinking about what do I do when this happens because it's going to happen. If you end up on a perimeter, you are going to run into that, and you need to know what you're going to do. That's a very good point. So let's let's go ahead and shift in and talk about special considerations. So let's talk about schools. Obviously, with schools, you have parents that are going to come in. They are going to be very upset, mm-hmm. not in a very great state of mind. Right. As all three of us are parents, not reasonable, not rational. Yeah, we get it. Totally get we, it. We, we, we totally get it. But at the end of the day, you can't let them Mm-mm. blow past the outer perimeter. So what are – how does that impact the math that goes in for the perimeter group supervisor who's got to oversee that and make sure that they've got staffing? What are the special considerations for a school? Well, I think that's that's the biggest one I would think, uh, and and keeping the media away. You know, we we have the we adopt the posture that for even in the aftermath, we protect the the, the survivors and the kids from three things: the elements, gunfire, and the eyes of the media. So we keep them under out out of the elements, out of you know, from, from further harm and from the eyes of the media. So you have to be cognizant and aware of all those things. And I think one of the – Pete hit it earlier in the big one, knowing your modes of ingress and egress, knowing where the parents are probably going to come from and quadrupling your manpower there in anticipation of that because they are going to come in there. You're not going to stop me. I mean, we, they're either going to drive up or walk up, right? right? And so, perimeter group supervisor working in concert with the incident commander, identifying a a parent muster area, a parent staging area, um, you know, developed depending on how long the event's going to happen, is I think key. Just like media, I mean, media is the mm-hmm. same thing. They're going to come from different areas, trying to get a good close camera 100%. look, and we have to be able to be ready to push them in an area where we can maintain control. Uh, Bill, you're familiar with the two events that I was on, one being a hoax and one being legit. And I can tell you both times, the parent, we lost control of the parents because we were focused on that immediate resource 
uh, going to the school and making sure we had enough officers coming in. And that, that's all depending on, you know, if you've got a thin response coming in to your event, you're going to keep flowing that and you're almost, you know, pushing that perimeter in the back of your mind till you feel like you've satisfied mm-hmm. that thirst for that, that initial response. But that's where you lose control of those parents coming in because they're, it's a, it's like a tidal wave. It I is. mean, they're coming quick. And not to vacillate too much, but like we were talking about parents, another challenge you're going to have along the lines of parents in the media, drones. When a drone comes over, who's going to see it first? Outer perimeter should. We hope. We hope. Exactly. We hope, you know, and if not inner perimeter, we hope. Does that we make, hope. We hope. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we need, and we need to know whose it is, where did it come from, what's it doing. I mean, that's those are some of the new special considerations that we have, but, but, um, I think the the three biggest ones for for most of them, not number one is containing the bad people, the bad actors for for the inner and the outer because you know the I'm from the Department of Redundancy Department. I'm a big diver, so uh, you know that's the outer perimeter is redundant inner perimeter. You know their primary purpose is to keep people out, but they also double as a as a Catch points, catch secondary point, catch right, points. Right, a catch story, a redundancy. So, you know, we got to be cognizant of that. So, um, what what is your advice to those cops that are on the perimeter post that are dealing with angry parents? We can all empathize with that. Uh, but is there some some things that you would suggest – to try to de-escalate it, to avoid the classic of parent being tackled on the ground and handcuffed, and you know the media, of course, is covering that because right. they can't get any closer. Well, it, the decision ultimately lies with the parents, truthfully. But you can't argue. We were just talking about this. You can't argue. You can't rationalize with irrational people. You can't reason with unreasonable people. As police officers. I'm, I know Pete's been doing this long enough. So I have been. We've all been called everything but a child of God. And you got to let him vent and then just calmly say, no, would you? I, I think you just hit the nail on the head there is don't overreact to that. Parent. Right. Don't buy into it. We, you know, to be able to quickly tell them that, um, you know, a quick brief that our command is working hard with the school system to keep you informed. Here's where you can go and stage and, and get additional information. Uh, I don't have any other information for you other than that. And, you know, just try to keep this, the, the situation as calm as possible. Knowledge, information to the parent is, is you right. know, helpful, calming. That's a big one. And, and Billy, now you're in a kind of a unique position because you're working directly with a school now. Right. How important is it for the school pre-event to kind of tell parents what to expect, what the communication plan is going to be, what the process is going to be? How much – if at all, does that impact the, the parental response? I would hope because it hasn't happened, but I would, but we, we, we do embolden them with knowledge. I do think it, it can't, it can't hurt and it has to help. Does that make sense? We have an old saying can't hurt might help. Can't hurt. I think it's definitely going to help. And because it, it's wargaming them in advance, it's already given them an idea. This is what's going to happen. And we've already warned them, this is going to be a long time coming. We're going to get you there as soon as we can. Because one of the things that the school wants the parents to know, they want them to come get the kids. They don't want to say, we want to keep them for a while. That's not true, said nobody ever. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, you know, the sooner they're out of there, the sooner they're not your responsibility anymore. Seriously, is that not transparent? Absolutely. And so we want to relinquish them. We want to surrender them to you. We want to turn them over. But every every single parent has to be checked by ID and has to sign off the, the sheet from the I love you guys dot org. You know, I mean, so I think I think that's that's important that they know. And once and so even if in the heat of the moment when you say we've we've told you about this, Mr. Kelting. This is going to happen, but this is what's going to have to happen first. It can go okay. Maybe. Maybe. So let me ask you this, and then I'm going to tangent to one of our other ones. If the the guy or the gal is working the post on the outer perimeter, of course, they're probably going to be listening to the tactical radio, even though they're 
they're assigned for for their perimeter duties. They're assigned to a different channel. channel, but they're they're going to be listening to what's going on. Is it is it appropriate? Is it okay for parents that are you know genuinely concerned and emotional to be able to tell them information they may not know? Like the, the there is no more active threat. We're working on rescuing the injured, and then you know, there's, this has to happen. Is it okay for them to provide some information that may not have been released to the, to the general public, or do we need to keep that close hold? I would keep that close hold personally. Yeah. I think it comes down to messaging from the command post. I mean, it'd be kept, you know, close to the chest, but the point of command getting a school uh, representative in the process early, quickly, and be able to get that messaging out and be able to tell a parent, you know, I mean, most schools nowadays, most have the, you know, the whole app that you sign right. up for is, is pay attention to that. Law enforcement has the, you know, the ability to put messages out and um, just refer them back to that and just try to calm their ease. I mean, if it's a vetted, there's no more threat and you say that's probably not going to hurt, but, you know, you want to try to keep as much information. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to skip over talking specifically about churches and hospitals because I think that they have a whole lot in common with the scenarios that we run into in schools. But let's talk for a minute about airports because airports can be a particular, uh, particularly challenging event. You've got uh, people, because the airports are so large, it's very likely that you're going to have a whole bunch of people inside your perimeter that have – nothing to do with the event that went on, didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. They just want to get their luggage and leave, or they want to be able to get on their flight and go that isn't going to go. You're going to have traffic problems out the wazoo at the perimeter. You may have people that are trying to leave. What are some of the, the special challenges in your mind of securing an airport? Each of you worked in an area where you had international airports you covered. In your mind, as you think about your airports and trying to get the perimeter wrapped and then deal with traffic and information diversion, what comes to top of mind? Craziness at an airport. Uh, like you said, the, the event may be isolated in a certain area. Um, you know, all the, the amount of airlines in an airport, they all have their own little emergency management plans. They all have their contracts with folks and stuff. But just gaining control of that initial incident, right, getting that inner perimeter set up, and then working on that. The traffic part of it for an airport is probably the biggest part is that ingress, egress to traffic because you actually, you know, end up having less ways in than most places that you can, you can grab pretty quickly. Uh, and then diverting incoming people, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. Right. We, we actually had a really big call at our airport where everything was shut down. The guy walked in with the backpacks and I have a bomb dropped at a, a TSA counter. That'll disrupt things. It, it was, it was a showstopper. And before that we had to go, we had to jump through a million hoops to get these special badges for the airport that had guns on mm -hmm. them. So you could be armed on the property and all this other stuff that all access. And then we have the call and we have our own agent, our own police department, at our, our, our airport. They took the inner perimeter the sheriff's office did the whole outer perimeter and the bomb squad and everybody did the the bomb thing. And I went down range on that and I was the only person on the whole concourse in the whole airport. And I was laughing going, nobody's here to check my badge. And uh, <laughs> by myself with the 1975 playing the chocolate coming over the radio, things you remember. But I mean, uh, um, but, you know, I think that it's going to be – it's huge. As big as you think it is, it's bigger. And I think utilizing – because even agencies that, that have a, a subsector or a zone assigned to the airport, they're, they're going to know it. They're going to have the inner perimeter and then have the, the other set up for the outer. And it's actually – it's big, but it is manageable. All right. Any other thoughts? Lots of training. You always hear me say, train early, don't train late. And train well. You hear us all, all say, make sure it's good training. Yeah. I, and I think I, I would just say as a general perspective, uh, I get it, but perimeter is not a place to zone out. 
If you are on a perimeter and you find yourself in your car, you're probably doing it wrong. There you go. All right. Well, thank you to our producer, Carla Torres, for uh, pulling our podcast together every week. Uh, we really appreciate you, Carla. Uh, please like and subscribe to the podcast. Share it with those that you work with. And until next time, stay safe.